Thank you so much. Um, my role here is to be ignored and like a good referee, hopefully not noticed. Um, so John, uh, I came across John quite recently actually. Um, as anyone knows in Ireland, there's been such a massive shift in dairy production uh, and in family farms in general, but dairy production in particular in the last you know, five or six years has been huge expansion of farms, a kind of radical transformation of how uh, dairy is produced, how milk is produced. Um, and, you know, some people, there's a huge positivity to it. It's given a lot of farmers, you know, a good income. Uh, at the moment, the dairy price is on the floor and a lot of farmers who've invested heavily are really worried. But there's also been another way of looking at it, which is this old, you know, in America's old Earl Butts sense of get big or get out. And uh, I, I'm always interested in coming across farmers who do something different and fly in the face of the kind of narrative, especially the narrative in the media. Um, so I came across John, he's a farmer in Leash, and John is an intensive conventional dairy farmer who's had a huge expansion uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, it's about 190 cows, 180 cows now. Um, and what was interesting to me is that John has had this kind of massive change. Uh, he decided to convert to organics and he is in that process now. So I wanted to uh, explore a little bit about that. Um, John, one of the things that you said to me, which I found hilarious, but also slightly depressing, is that when you told your discussion group, your friends, farmer friends, and um, those in the industry, that you were going to convert, you said two things. One, it was like saying that you're a born-again Christian. <laughs> and also, you said it was like repeatedly coming out of the closet. Yes. <laughs> now, you know, like it, it's quite shocking in many ways that that is still the attitude in Ireland. What is it that people are frightened of? Um, yeah, I think I suppose the circle I was in, uh, intensive dairy farmers, um, it's, it's been a profitable system and it's just, we, we don't tend to look outside our box, everything is working as it is. And um, it really shocked people, I suppose, to, to see somebody um, question, I suppose, what, what we were doing. And um, like when you're, do, when you're farming a certain way, and your father has probably farmed that way before, using fertilizers, using pesticides, we don't really question these things, they're just kind of uh, become the norm. And um, I suppose in, in, among dairy farming, uh, you all know, or some of you probably know about milk quotas, the abolition of milk quotas comes. So there's been a lot of excitement uh, within, within, the, within the industry about basically allowing expansion to happen since the 1983 when milk quotas came in, we have been, I suppose, uh, restricted. And uh, so the last few years, there's been a huge level of excitement among dairy farmers. So I suppose. That, that's really how there was such a, a level of shock. Like I, I, my own farm, I had expanded from 30 cows, I suppose, when I started farming in, in 2001, up to 160 cows last year. And the plan was to bring the farm to 240 cows. And all the stock were in place there to, to make that happen. And um, that, it's a profitable system, or it has been at least over the last number of years. And I think because dairy farming has been profitable, I think people haven't uh, really considered organic farming or they haven't been, you know, they, and so that was really what, how it was shocked people, I think. And you said to me that the reason you were converting is, part of the reason is that you use this phrase, you know, we are defending the indefensible. Yeah. Can you just explain a little bit about that? And, and was there one moment where you just went, right, that's it, I'm out? Or, or was it a transition over time? Um, yeah, it was definitely a transition over time. Um, Two years ago, like, I was definitely defending the indefensible as well. Like, we, we tend not to look at ourselves as being part of the problem. Uh, it's easy for farmers to, um, to blame others um, and, and justify what we're doing, as in we need to feed growing world population, and this is the only way that works. But um, I suppose I like to think I have a, an open mind, or a somewhat open mind, and um, I wasn't adverse to the idea of organic farming, but it was kind of left in the long finger for a while. And I suppose with milk quotas going, it did seem like a suitable time to reassess where I was going. And um, a few things, I suppose, stood out. Uh, but but I, I started, anyway, reading different books and looking up on the internet, and I attended a Soil Matters conference last year. And eventually, I just the more I looked into it, the more I really felt that... Um, we, we can't, I can't stay going the way we're going. And I know in Ireland, we, we have this idea that we are, we're probably farming more sustainably than maybe most other countries. And maybe we are somewhat, but I can still see so many problems with how we're doing it. Uh, also, the birth of your child was quite seminal. Yeah, so my son Paddy was born in 2014. 
And again, I suppose, um, like most uh, new parents, you're really making every effort to uh, provide the best food for him and the best start in life. And again, I suppose that uh, makes, makes you think a lot, I suppose, and it makes you think about the food we eat and um, how nutritious or free of chemicals it is. Yeah. Uh, for those who, who aren't farmers or don't know a huge amount about the, the methods in farming, can you just briefly describe uh, in the intensive conventional sense uh, how you were farming in a way that concerned you? So, like, literally, what were you using that was concerning? What kind of resources were you worried about? Yep, so I suppose, well, most people um, are very aware of pesticides, obviously, for, for example, and maybe they don't associate dairy farming to a huge extent with that. But, um, but um, that's an obvious one, but I think the biggest one really is probably nitrogen fertilizer. And um, it very much feeds on from this morning's uh, uh, com or presentations on, on carbon in the soil. But um, uh, every farmer, or most farmers in Ireland use, um, and particularly intensive dairy farmers, use up to uh, 240, 250 kilos of, of nitrogen per hectare. And um, uh, a, lot, a few figures that I've seen, I think 2% uh, of the world's fossil fuels actually are used to produce uh, the nitrogen for agricultural crops. And for every tonne of nitrogen, uh, it, seven tonnes of carbon are released into the atmosphere. And um, on top of that, we have nitric oxide released from, from using all, from nitrogen, and that's 310 times more damaging to the environment than actually carbon. So um, all them things like... Uh, they sound terrible, but most farmers think you can't do without nitrogen, but that's the big shock that I come when The more I investigate, the more I realize that actually we can farm totally without artificial nitrogen, and it's actually damaging our system. And we can farm, I think, equally as productively and achieve the same levels of output. And, and, and how much was your fertilizer bill every year? How much is it? Yes, yeah, so it was between 30 and 40,000 the last few years. And again, obviously, there's only one direction that's going to go over the next few years. With uh, It's obviously hugely related to oil price. So, um, yeah, it's pretty much most farmers' biggest cost. 30 to 40,000 a year mm. spent on fertilizer. Yep. That's astonishing. So with the organic system, how, what, how are you going to, to change? How do you do it? Yeah, so um, I suppose that's where uh, it's really, again, boils all down to what Danielle was talking about and soil carbon. And that's, I suppose, maybe the very convenient thing that um, we, can, we can actually solve two problems in one. But actually, by, by putting carbon in the soil, we actually um, uh, can, can, can produce, can create a system that actually functions very highly. And um, I suppose, luckily, I didn't have to... Uh, come up with all this myself, but actually there's farmers in the past who have done it. And um, I suppose uh, Robert Elliott, back in the 18, late 1800s, early 1900s, actually devised the Clifton Park system of farming specifically to actually put more carbon in the soil. And this wasn't from an environmental point of view. This was actually to achieve higher yields in his crops. And, um, and briefly, how does that system work? So again, it's basically diversity. Like all these herbs in front of us here, actually I've incorporated a few of these into my own swords. Um, but uh, for, for, to store soil, like, I suppose that the, the typical farmer in Ireland, or typical intensive farmer, has uh, lovely fields of grass, but they're basically a monoculture of perennial ryegrass. And all the roots are at the same level. And that's a system that basically can only sustain itself if we bring in chemical inputs, so nitrogen fertilizer, along with uh, lots of uh, mineral supplementation for to the cows to make up for the shortfalls that, that's there and even phosphorus and, um, and potassium. But all these plants here, like they all form different the relationships with different bacteria and fungi. By having them in the sward, we can uh, create much healthier soils and uh, store a lot more carbon. Some of them have very deep roots, which will bury carbon deep down into the soils. And then actually there's a synergy in, in growing them together with grass that actually um, basically the, the output can be of higher performance than just having a, a monoculture of grass. So there was this moment on John's farm when I visited and we went out to his fields because you said you wanted to show me one of the fields and he pointed over to the perennial ryegrass, which is, you know, kind of beautiful to look at. Yes, but you said basically, you pointed to that and you said to me, that's like eating white bread all day, every day. And then the cows are, are given supplements in order to make up for the nutri nutritional shortfall. And then you were s sitting, John was sitting in a field surrounded by this kind of experiment that he's running with his soil and with the varieties of grasses and, and various herbs that you're 
you're yeah. planting. And the idea, just tell us a little bit about then the idea of that as you go into organic production when you've converted. Yeah, so well, again, this isn't my, um, <laughs> I'm not the first person to ever do this, but Newman Turner, I suppose, um, back in the 1940s and 50s was um, really made it very applicable, I suppose, to an Irish dairy farmer's point of view. He was a dairy farmer in England. And um, so he had really trialed a lot of these different herbs and ones that actually are, uh, are very nutritious and edible for cows. And, um, he, and basically, his, the results were that he stored huge amounts more carbon in his soils and actually was at a stocking rate equivalent to, or probably ahead of most intensive Irish dairy farms with no fertilizer inputs. And again, on top of that, he actually had practically zero uh, health problems in his cows. And um, again, I think, I suppose we sometimes forget, but actually uh, health or being healthy is the default state for most people if we have a good healthy diet and um, the same for cows. And um, so, that's, that's really the premise, is, is, and, and it's the same for our soil then. If we have that diversity in our soil, you, that's how you get healthy soils, and that's how you properly build carbon and build humus into our soils. And so you've got this field that is just full of you know, yep. variety. A, a few of them now. I've planted a few more since. So, the, yep. so uh, over the course of the next uh, few years, all my perennial ryegrass will be um, uh, replaced with kind of a, a mix of t a, a 20 or more different uh, species. And, um, yep. Is it nerve-wracking to do what you're doing, given that this is not new, this is not something that you've done before, obviously? Um, I would actually say no, and I wouldn't say I'm the most um, generally self-assured person on, on every issue, but for some reason on this, I have no doubt that I'm doing the right thing. Um, I think I believe um, the, it has been done before, and it's been done very effectively before. Um, and it, it makes total sense, to be honest to me. I can understand the science behind it. I can understand the logic behind it. And um, so, look, there, there, there is a level of, um, in most people's eyes, they think, you know, geez, that's a risky thing to do, like to, um, to uh, you know, basically risk everything I was doing before. But I don't see it that way. It's, it's actually not the, the big level of risk that most people think also, because um, I think we're on, a, we're on the cusp of big change regardless. Um, in agriculture, in that we're on a point where actually, um, because of the cost of chemical inputs, um, that it's actually borderline. When you take all them out, we're, we're, you can borderline be equally as profitable, uh, um, even without get a, getting a premium price for your product. Um, you can borderline be equally as profitable um, by, by adopting organic standards. And, and the kind of changes then, um, in terms of animal welfare, uh, can you talk a little bit about that and, and how that's going to shift on your farm? You have, what, 190 cows? Sorry, yeah, now, sorry, no, I had 160 cows last, probably a, a, a 210 livestock units in total when you uh, take account of all the other um, animals on the farm. And so, yeah, so I've destocked um, back to uh, livestock units, uh, 1.5 livestock units per hectare. So that's um, a, actually it's a 40% reduction in, in stocking rate from last year, but that's probably... Um, and from so far, probably way too much. I think the farm can sustain a lot, a lot more. And probably to um, most of my uh, colleagues' amazement so far, how, how well, like, I, we're part of this, um, I suppose it's a computer program where we measure grass growth every week. And um, so I measure and share all my information with uh, 30 other dairy farmers. And so I can see all their grass growths, they can see mine. And I think most of them have been uh, slightly disillusioned so far this year about how little response they're getting from all the nitrogen they have applied. Because um, uh, to my even own amazement, my grass seems to be growing as well as theirs without any of these inputs. But, uh, and that's despite all the shortfalls I can still see in my own system. Um, what do you put that down to? Um, yeah, well, I, to be honest, partly actually, and I, I was, uh, is that nitrogen has been totally oversold. Um, and I actually was talking to one of the researchers from Moore Park actually just last week at a discussion group about this. And um, so like farmers were constantly being told that one of the best returns we can get is actually by spreading nitrogen in our soil, that it's 150% return on investment. And like that's obviously massive. And uh, but when you look a little more closely at that and how they actually draw up these calculations, so they have um, obviously trial plots and they, they'd have, a, obviously, a plot where they're applying nitrogen, and they'd have another plot where, actually, it's a control plot where no nitrogen is applied, 
but in, in establishing this control plot, the first thing they do, obviously, is to make sure it's only, only uh, one species of um, usually perennial ryegrass, and so obviously any other species will be sprayed off with a herbicide, and again, that obviously has very negative effects on the soil life. Then they obviously have to balance the phosphorus and the potassium in the soil, so they use like murate of potash and uh, acid phosphate, and again, they have very negative effects on the soil life. And that's how they, so basically, they're comparing a nitrogen situation with a, a monoculture of grass grown in a biologically low activity soil. And, uh, but that shouldn't be the reality on any, it, t t if you throw in a, a legume, for instance, into that mix, which are pretty much are, are, exist on most farms, straight away that the get gap really narrows. And then if you actually have biologically active soil and bacteria and fungi cycling nutrients, then basically the gap can disappear. And it's interesting because the talks here, the theme, the overall theme has been local hero, global hero. And it is, you know, has been really interesting to hear what and, and, and the absolute astonishing power that individuals can have in actually just starting to do something different. In Ireland, there are, am I right in saying 29 organic dairy farmers? Are you the 30th? No, there was just, I think there, there's actually a few more in the last um, round of our, so there, there, there'll be slightly over 40, I think. Uh, 40, okay, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. so a lot more. Um, it's still a tiny, tiny, yeah, tiny, tiny percentage of all the dairy farmers in the country. Um, uh, you know, the attitude that you got when you decided to tell people that this is what you're going to do, uh, did that surprise you? Uh, no, it didn't surprise me, I suppose. Um, as I said, it did feel like actually coming out of the, clo <laughs> out of the closet. It was, um, I was getting sick at, at, uh, of telling people, basically. Uh, I had to actually, um, it wasn't something I suppose I could uh, keep to myself. I was involved in um, a, a joint venture between Chagas and Glombia, a monitor farm program uh, last year, and um, basically where all my figures were opened up to, uh, there was a text message sent out every week, and there was a few open days on the farm. And so this wasn't something I could just like uh, keep to myself and just work away without. But I basically had to uh, tell tell my Chagas advisors, Columbia reps, that uh, that I wanted to do this. And obviously, then I had to leave that program because they weren't um, they were pushing a certain agenda, which is more milk, in a, obviously in the conventional sense. And um, so yeah, so I couldn't uh, keep this to myself, and I was kind of gone to the point where uh, I was sick of telling people and trying to justify justify what I'm doing to pr to probably, I think, I suppose intensive dairy farmers are the least um, open audience maybe to uh, to what to what I was doing. Um, yeah. Uh, and finally, I think we're we're coming up against the time now. Um, you were. Uh, you were sense now in terms of how you're farming. I mean, has it has it changed in any way? Is it harder work? Are you enjoying it less or more? Have you are you looking at the farm differently? Um, yeah, I think I'm definitely looking at the farm differently. Um, I think you have to become more observant, and um, I would say, like for a lot of farmers this year, I know for a lot of my colleagues, it was quite a stressful spring. Growth rates were uh, were quite poor. Um, but I actually found it quite a, a relaxing spring. Uh, maybe that's because I have destocked maybe uh, greater than I needed to, but uh, there was no real pressure on the system whatsoever this spring. Um, and I'm probably a ahead of expectations on what the farm what is producing so far. Um, yeah, there, like I think you do become more observant. I think uh, before, like to, even all these things, like two years ago, like uh, ramsons or wild garlic or things like that, I wouldn't have even paid attention to them. I think now, for instance, I know there actually there's quite a lot of it on our farm at the minute, and I know if cows could get access to it, they would actually gobble it up and maybe taint the milk. But um, I think you do you do pay a lot more attention to the variety of uh, different herbs and species that, that the cows could, could be a benefit to. And, and absolutely, finally, when uh, since you have decided to do this, um, the people that you've met, the communities that you've met in Ireland, there's an incredible community of, of farmers who are organic here uh, across all sectors, but also people here that you've met. Yep. We were in the barn together, you met a lot of people. What has been your, your attitude to that and, and how have you found it? Yeah, to be honest, it's extremely positive. Obviously, coming from a, a circle maybe who are close-minded to it, it's uh, extremely positive. And to see the passion of... Um, of so many people, and um, I know actually recently I, I attended um, a, a butter and cheese making course down here in Ballymaloo, and um, even just to see Doreen Allen obviously speaking and her insight into actually she was going on about 
uh, diversity in, in sports and a lot of the same things that basically I've probably only come to that conclusion in the last, uh, in the last year. And um, so it is very, um, obviously, very comforting to uh, talk to people who share the same opinions. Wonderful. Um, well, I wish you all the best in what you're doing. I think it is incredible to, to take the risk and to do it, especially at a time when, in some ways, you were the poster boy for a different way of doing things. And it's uh, really heartening to see people who have a sort of independent thinking about what they're doing. Um, you're going to be here. John is going to be here at the Q&A, I think. Is that right, Mark? So if you have any questions or anything, then he'll be here for you. But uh, thanks a million for sharing your story. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.